This week in preparation for your work next week, we're going to talk about or start to familiarize yourselves with what an argument is, an academic argument specifically, and what claims are when it comes to your argumentative essays that you'll write this semester. So a claim is an assertion of fact or belief that is supported with evidence. And we talked about in building your thesis statement that you're going to list your claims in the thesis statement that back up your overall um, claim, your main claim for your paper. So a claim is just an assertion of fact or belief that is supported with evidence. So you make your claim, it's in your thesis, but then you make it in your topic sentence in the same way that Parker used something like poverty is dirt. That was her topic sentence. So that's her claim. Evidence is the information that backs up the claim. And you cannot assume that the reader has your life experience and they're going to understand and believe your claim without proof. So that evidence is examples and illustrations. In Parker's case, she used examples and illustration from her lived experience. And your first argument paper, you are going to be writing about an argument of definition. You're going to define something based on your lived experience and your evidence is going to then be examples from real life. A main claim or thesis summarizes the writer's position on the situation. Claims can be claims of fact, claims of value, and claims of policy. And you can include multiple types of claims within an argumentative paper. A claim of fact um, is an assertion or argument that seeks to define or classify something or establish that a problem or con condition existed, exists, or will exist. So you're going to be saying something like this, poverty is. And so whatever you're choosing to define is, you're claiming as fact that this is what it is. Most claims of fact are debatable and challenge us to provide evidence. And that's the key is what evidence is going to be compelling enough to prove that claim. Most are interpretations of the evidence. In other words, somebody else with the same evidence might come to a different conclusion, a different interpretation. The writer draws a conclusion based on reasoning and includes an explanation. And the key is to make that explanation because your reader does not think the way you think. And if you want to convince them, you have to show that on the page through evidence and explanation of what that evidence means. And claim of fact might seek to define or classify such as poverty is. And so that's what your, your next paper is going to be is an argument of definition where you pick a word or concept to define as a claim of fact. So there are two scientists who claim that female students were more likely to be visible members, invisible members of the classroom, and teachers interact differently with male and female teachers. They were claiming as fact that this happened, that, that male students and female students were treated differently. Readers will want to see how the SACRs support those claims with fact um, claims of fact with evidence. In other words, we're not just going to take their word for this. We're going to need some proof. A claim of value expresses an evaluation of the problem that has existed, exists, or will exist. So the key with the claim of value is that phrase evaluation. Is the condition good or bad? So if Parker had said poverty is bad, that would be a value judgment. Um, if, is the condition important or inconsequential? If we're just looking at a pair of shoes, maybe inconsequential, but when we're looking at systemic poverty in the United States or across the globe, um, it would be important enough. Uh, and then presents a judgment which is sometimes signaled by value-laden words like ugly, beautiful, immortal, good, or bad. Those are value words. And so if you're claiming, if you're making a claim of value, then you're saying it's good or bad, ugly, beautiful, immoral, whatever, whatever value you place on that. So in that same study um, that I used earlier as an example, the Sadkers claim that male and female students are treated differently um, and they judge it as consequential because they impact self-esteem, achievement, and career options. So they back up their claim of value saying it's bad that female students are treated differently and here's why and they backed it up with evidence. So the reader then needs to see evidence of these evaluations. So does gender bias affect self-esteem? They would have to prove that with evidence. Um, they would need 
to provide, quote, good reasons, which really just means evidence, and then an explanation of the evidence in a way that's compelling to your reader. A claim of policy is an argument that something should exist. It's a call for change or a solution to a problem. It uses signal words such as should or must. Poverty must be addressed in this generation. That would be a claim of policy. We're saying that this policy should exist in our culture. So if Parker made a claim of policy, it might look something like poverty must be eradicated, otherwise more than half our children will be shortchanged. I'm sure it's not half. I hope it's not half. But that's a claim of policy because she's saying it must be eradicated, which means we must have some sort of policy in effect to fix that. So when you see a claim, um, and you might see some in the rhetorical analysis, you can ask these questions to help you define what kind of claim they're making. So does the argument assert that a problem exists, has existed, or will exist? That is a claim of fact. Poverty is dirt. Does the argument express an evaluation of a problem or condition? Such as, poverty is bad, that's a claim of value. If you ask, does the argument call for change, that's a claim of policy. Poverty must be eradicated. That's a claim of policy. So those are claims that you make and then you provide the evidence to prove. When you're analyzing an argument and when you present your own argument, one of the things you need to look at are the reasons that support the claim. So if you, in support, if you're, let's back that up a minute, to support your claim, any evidence you have must be recent, reliable, relevant, and accurate. I sometimes call them the four R's, so you'll notice the R in accurate is capitalized. That's just sort of an easy way to remember it. Claims should be backed up with evidence that is recent, reliable, relevant, and accurate. The, the textbook you'll see uh, in the reading, I don't remember if it's this week or later in the semester, they use, the textbook uses the phrase um, object objection, I call this a concession. It's you're making a concession to the other side. A concession acknowledges that readers may not re agree with every point the reader is making. It acknowledges that I can see where someone may take issue with the point I'm making. The willingness to make a concession is valued in academic writing because it acknowledges the complexity and importance of multiple perspectives. Guess what? That's what academics is all about. We do not want to be right in the same way you might on a debate stage. It's about discourse or conversation, which is why I have you read that piece on entering the conversation. The One of the more recent Dan Brown books is called Origin. It's kind of fascinating. Like it's this combination of artificial intelligence and historical symbology. It's kind of fascinating. But there's a line in there, the character is a history professor above all else. Like he's a writer and obviously gets in these major um, action thriller type scenes. But he makes a statement that's very much a professor mentality, which is discourse is more valuable than consensus. And what he's really saying there is, it's the conversation that we value in academics. We want that conversation. We don't want to be definitive and have everybody agree because that's boring. It's the conversation or the discourse that matters. So I, to identify concessions, look for signal phrase that typically um, show you that they're going to be making a concession. It is true that. So that's a, that's a phrase that you can use. I agree with Parker or X, that Y is important factor to consider. So I agree with Parker that poverty is important factor to consider. Or some studies have shown that this. Um, you'll see, I think it's in Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from Birmingham jail. He uses the phrase, some say, or some will say, or some have said. That's another way of bringing in that multiple perspective. What Parker does is she uses that phrase, but you say, what about health clinics? But you say, what about schools? And so that's her way of making concession, saying, I can hear you disagreeing with my concept, so I'm going to make a concession and say, but you say, what about healthcare? The writer then addresses the concession, explaining how it needs to be modified in light of evidence from the writer's perspective. So the textbook uses that as a reply to the, to the objection, 
or in this, in kind of the way I was taught rhetoric, it's the counter argument. So you concede it to the other side and then you make a counter argument for why that um, evidence doesn't work or why that suggestion doesn't work. But you say, what about health clinics? And then she brings up that annoying detail about her neighbor. That's the counter argument. Identify counter arguments. Um, the best friend of a writer in academics is the person who sees multiple perspectives. I can typically argue multiple sides of the same topic because I was taught to identify what the other side thinks and what they might object to. So if you have somebody in your life who is a really good devil's advocate, they are your best friends for figuring out how to concede to the other, gives a concession to the other side and then turn it around into a counter argument. In an argument that is more conversational than confrontational, and that's key for academics, it's not about ranting. Um, it's conversational. Writers establish areas of common ground, both to convey different views that are understood and to acknowledge the conditions under which those differing views are valid. Writers do this by making concessions and anticipating and responding to counter arguments. So there's a Rogerian approach to an argument. There's four steps. You'll read some other ones in the textbook, and they're all different ways of the same thing, which is making sure you have a compelling argument. So in a Rogerian approach, you convey to the reader that their different views are understood. You're essentially saying, hey, reader, look, I get what you're objecting to. I can hear what you're saying right now. And acknowledge the conditions under which readers' views are valid. So when Parker starts talking about what, what um, but you say, what about health clinics? Um, she's, she kind of is saying, hey, that might work if you live in the city or have access to transportation, right? She's making that acknowledgement that they are right in certain cases. It helps the reader to see the writer shares common ground. Um, and that the writer kind of sees what objections people might have. It creates mutually acceptable solutions to an agreed upon problem. In a written conversation, the give and take of face-to-face -face conversation takes the form of anticipating readers' counter arguments and uses language that is both empathetic and respectful of the reader. In other words, you are not ranting and yelling and pointing your finger at your reader. You're engaged in a conversation and you're saying, hey, I hear you. I see what you're saying. Here's why it's not true. And that becomes then the counter argument. That's the basis. Your next paper is going to be an argument paper. So it's important that you understand these concepts.